As great as the new Oppenheimer film is, is it historically accurate? I don't believe so. We're going to talk about the film and some disclosure if you dig into the historical facts about this film, as well as what Oppenheimer knew from the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita. Stay tuned for some very interesting facts that you're not going to want to miss. What is going on, everybody? Ken here. Welcome to Ungraduated Media. This is the show, your show, that is not only about physical media, the collecting of movies, books, and music. It's about the learning and the perspective that we can gain from those three mediums that are physical media. And today, I am thrilled to talk to you all about this. I have been holding out for Oppenheimer for some time. I wanted to see it in theaters, but did not have really the greatest opportunity to see it and didn't have a theater with IMAX capability close enough to view that 70 millimeter IMAX film. Now I heard that it was actually pretty cool to experience, but man, I tell you what, this 4K, the mastering that was done and how Christopher Nolan oversaw it to make sure he brought the best experience home, it's been so remarkable seeing the response that has been given with this film. Physical media selling out everywhere. This is the Icon edition. I had so wanted to get the Best Buy exclusive steelbook, but a month or so ago, whenever I found out about it being able to be pre-ordered, it had already been uh, out of stock online from Best Buy. So I was able to get this Icon edition that I now hear is selling out as well in Walmart. So before I get into talking too much about the film, let me just preface this. This is not clickbait by any means. I have been researching ancient history uh, very intently with a strange fascination, quite frankly, uh, to our origin and where we come from and a lot of the known history and also mythology, quote unquote mythology, as well as the different stories that exist from biblical times and different ancient scriptures and teachings a lot of times known as allegories or myths, uh, sometimes metaphors in terms of how they speak. Well, here are some just straight up facts for you. Of course, in the film, it is discussed, Oppenheimer, of course, being quoted that he is now, uh, he is death, destroyer of worlds. I am become death, destroyer of worlds is the famous quote. But what's not often talked about is he was interviewed afterwards about the Trinity bomb. And if it had been the first of its kind. And he says, quote, yes, in modern times. What the hell did he mean by that in modern times? Well, stay tuned because we're going to get into depth around that conversation. I'm not going to want to make this too long of a video, but I did want to jump in and record my thoughts fresh after watching this film. There's so much to discuss here, so I'm going to be as concise as I can and try to stay to the point. So before I get to the real nuts and bolts of this, I do want to discuss the actual film itself. This thing is beautiful in every single context of the word. The cinematography is fantastic in this. The sound quality, it absolutely rumbled my entire theater room. This probably gave my theater room the best workout sound-wise that I think it's had this entire year. I've had this new setup which is described in the description of this video and all the videos that I've been doing recently. My entire audio video system setup is there for you. It has a full 11.2 surround sound system with Dolby Atmos. Although this film does not come with Dolby Atmos, Nolan did an absolutely incredible job. I had been hearing from everybody how, of course, he insisted to go out and get the physical copy, pay respects to it because he knew that digitally, streaming wise this could not capture or this couldn't be captured like it could on a actual disc with the space the storage space to be able to house the beautiful picture quality as well as the sound quality that this film truly has to pay it proper respects especially if you have the right kind of home theater setup system you've got to listen to this and watch it on 4k on a disc format it's stunning it's beautiful. It does pan between the full screen with the 70 millimeter IMAX filmography, as well as the 239 bars 
So Christopher Nolan, known for this in most of his films, when it comes to, to using the 70 millimeter cameras, he is allowing the full screen and the detail, the beauty within it to be fully displayed. And then it'll cut to a 2.39 by one aspect ratio in which that you will get more drawn into the conversation points as well as the actual more dialogue aspects of the film. But man, gorgeous, gorgeous film. I'll talk about the packaging here. Uh, I think by now probably a lot of you have seen the Icon Edition, but I will go ahead and give it a quick reveal. It's, as you can tell probably, it's a little wider than what a lot of typical 4K or Blu-ray cases are. So it's gonna fit kind of strange on a shelf. It's also uh, a lot thinner. It's, it's just got a very thin component to the spine. Here's a look at the back of this, special features. I did not watch any special features yet, uh, but this does have a slipcase on it, and then the Icon Edition. Uh, this is the first Icon Edition that I've ever purchased. It has this magnetic clasp that kind of holds this together, so that pops open. I hope you can hear this, how it kind of clicks together. But uh, beautiful artwork on the interior of this does have a digital code, which I probably will never use, but this thing opens up to reveal what is the, not press conference, but uh, where Oppenheimer is being deposed, essentially, and questioned before Congress is what I perceive this to be. And then as you flip this around, you got some more art. You have the main cover as well as the back and some more photography. That kind of winds out. And as most will tell you, as, as cool as this is, the biggest problem with it, I think, is that the discs are housed inside of these uh, cardboard cases or sleeves, if you will. So it leaves the possibility of the disc to be scratched is my only complaint. But beautiful addition. I'm not going to pull out the actual CD or sorry, discs, because uh, I don't want to mess around with with that right now. But that's really there's not much else to say about the film. It's a fantastic film, beautifully done sound quality. I could not give it more of a resounding five star, even for that five point one track that it has. It's truly remarkably done because there was times where it felt like there was audio spatially all around you. I'm, there was even a few times when I found myself looking up at my Atmos to make sure there wasn't sound coming out of the Atmos. That's how well done this film is from an audio mix standpoint. Damn, whoever mastered this, I know Nolan helped oversee it and he put a lot of time and effort into it. From the very get-go, this thing rumbles. And it's not only because of the bomb blast, right? There's the famous part of the film about midway through when they actually test the Trinity bomb. And of course, it's magnificent in its overall glory of, of the uh, mushroom cloud, fiery orangish red. And it goes for a minute or so, and then you hear the rumble, which is, of course, just amazing in itself to know that light travels so much faster than sound. So you're seeing this billowing effect, and it takes forever before the sound and the wind to actually hit. But besides that, with all the, the Newtonian physics happening, and they cut to a lot of different scenes showing just the physical elements of metaphysics and quantum mechanics and the study of the, the, the atoms and the nuclear fission that takes place, there's a lot of that vibration and movement in the film, which I thought was genius by Nolan. Uh, there's parts of the film whenever Oppenheimer is being interrogated or questioned, and you can see behind him the vibration of it's kind of trying to emulate his tenseness in the moment or the tenseness of the moment and there's rumbling of bass and it doesn't sound muddy it sounds well if your sound system's actually dialed in and i'm not saying mine's the best i do have uh a dirac uh dialed in system so i use dirac live and i've tried audacity and different um sound equalizer systems or sound enhancement systems uh, to try to get my theater sound as dialed in as it can possibly be. And the Dirac Live it seems to be the best for me. So with two subwoofers in the front and I have sound shakers in my theater seats, I can assure you I was getting a massage most of this film. 
but it sounded great and it looks great. So that's that part. And now I want to dive into some of the perspective that I'll try to be as concise with as I can that I think need to be mentioned about this film. When I went into this film, what I was so hoping that I would find would be the, the digging into the Bhagavad Gita, not just the study that Oppenheimer was obviously infatuated with. And it's not surprising he was infatuated with the Bhagavad Gita because of there's a lot of mythology, supposed mythology in this book that might actually be more than just that around explosions and war and technology, things that I'm sure as he was studying, he was uncovering and questioning. So much like the Bible or any other ancient text, I think the mistake that many people in society today make is that it's just, it's folklore, or mythology, it's exaggerated stories. But you got to realize that this stuff was documented by people of the time in how they recollect and kept track of historical context. And just because it's the modern era and we decide to make Western philosophy the standard that there's no way to say all Eastern philosophy is just bogus and it's just mythology. You can even look at the Greek mythology and the stories of that. And when they talk about gods, okay, this is where my mind had to really expand itself. It used to be mythology for me too. But what if, this is where you must expand your perspective in your mind, what if extraterrestrials not only exist, but they have been here before? Before our known recorded time of Western current modern day lifestyle, right? When we really started to kind of keep track from about the medieval times and the Renaissance times into the industrial area era and now what we believe to be well what we know as historical context so i have been diving deep into the bhagavad gita as well as the mahabharata for some time now and yes oppenheimer is quoted as i am become death destroyer of worlds but again back to my earlier point he's also quoted as stating that this was not or at least it was the biggest known development in modern time. So again, what did he mean by adding in that in modern time aspect? Well, if you go back into the Mahabharata, the book of Drona, this is where a very interesting story comes from this aspect of a war being fought by two ancient civilizations and Drona was an ancient warrior. So this book of Drona is, is quite lengthy. And I've got some spots highlighted in here that I will get to in a moment that I will share with you that it is very enlightening perspective about the actual perspective of what has come from this war involving nuclear destruction. And you have to say to yourself, well, if known history, the 5,000 or so years that we believe that we've been taught is known history. Well, that can't be because the Trinity bomb and the A-bomb that came from Oppenheimer had to be the first, right? That's what we're taught. When you go back into the ancient Sanskrit texts and you read about this ancient war, you can find some details and some actual present day modern proof to the testing that science has done that some nuclear explosion did indeed occur, or at least is speculated to have occurred. It's hard to say did indeed, because do I know for sure? Of course not. Scientists are testing the soil and have tested the soil and have found very high traces of radioactive, uh, radioactive compounds that has vitrified glass, essentially. So it's turned a lot of the minerals and uh, the ore into a very fine glass that only happens with very high rates of temperature that occur at a very quick uh, speed. They have found the skeletons, family skeletons, in what they describe in postures of flight, meaning that they were fleeing. And all of this is being unearthed uh, in this, 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 this ancient location 
uh, that's somewhere in the Middle East. I'll have to pull up the exact details of where this actually is occurring. But there's also a crater, a large crater, that is also visible from Google Earth that shows this location on the map that has no meteor, no asteroid impact. It's just a massive crater that has this higher level of radioactivity that's been discovered within the soil. So all of this is being added up to perhaps there wasn't necessarily just mythology here or just ancient stories. This might have been documented evidence of some technology that existed, be it from an extraterrestrial race, be it from just we were more advanced than what we realized. And again, modern history, just what we are told 5,000 years to now. Well, what if we destroyed ourselves? What if we had this technology at some point in time? And it wasn't from extraterrestrials. We were just a more advanced society. And through a war, perhaps nuclear war, we as humankind destroyed ourselves and life started over. Who knows? Who's to say? But that's for you to discover and decide for yourself. But the fact of the matter is that it wasn't called out in the film for the level that I think it probably should have been. So let me get into some more depth, some more detail for, for all of you who care to know in regards to what I'm discussing. In this actual book of Drona, which again is just a part of the Mahabharata, this is a very thick book, it's just one book of the Mahabharata, I'm going to read to you, yes, I know it sucks to kind of read on YouTube, but I want to get this actually correct. So I am going to actually read this. So it says, uh, this is a description of what the actual war was like. So just check this out. There was what was weapons, magical weapons that were described as Astra, A-S-T-R-A, that could destroy entire armies, causing crowds of warriors with steeds and elephants and weapons to be carried away as if they were dry leaves of trees. A different weapon was described as producing vertical billowing smoke clouds that opened consecutively like giant umbrellas, reminiscent of the massive rising mushroom clouds produced by the Trinity test. It goes on to state that among the most destructive of the Astra was the Brahmastra, created by the god Brahma, B-R-A-H-M-A, -A, a single projectile charged with all the power in the universe. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death, which reduced to ashes an entire race. There was neither a counterattack nor a defense that could stop it. And this is right out of the book of Drona. The weapon produced an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns that rose in all its splendor after corpses were so burned as to be unrecognizable. Their hair and nails fell out. Pottery broke without any apparent cause and birds turned white. After a few hours, all foodstuffs were infected. Any target hit by the Brahmastra would be utterly destroyed. Land would become barren and lifeless. Rainfall would cease and infertility in humans and animals would follow for eons of time. This was used after an 18-day battle of the Kurkashrita, K-U-R-U-K-S-H-E-T-R-A. So this was a battle fought between the Kurkashrita and the Pandavas is what they are known as, the P-A-N-D-A-V-A-S. The Pandavas vanquished their enemy, the Kuravas, with de this devastating weapon. But the very few surviving Pandavas discovered that there was nothing left to occupy and no one left to rule. The Brahmastra had destroyed the entire Kuravas society and turned the region which is present day Rajasthan to desert. The war also marked in the Vedic system the beginning of the current Kali Yuga age. So again, is this mythology? 
that comes from the Mahabharata, the book of Drona? Is it allegory? You be the judge of that yourself. But I am just telling you this. When it comes to the known history, and you do some research into historical context, if you believe that modern civilization, what we are taught in Western worlds today, that modern civilization has only been around for 5,000 years, personally, I think you're being a little bit naive. To think that the earth has been here for 4 billion or so years, that modern history, where we think we are the most advanced society to face and walk and grace this planet, and we've only existed in this modern way for about 5,000 years, to me, it doesn't really add up. So when you go back and you find things like the Mahabharata, the the Bhagavad Gita, uh, all the ancient scrolls that are now the Dead Sea Scrolls and the ancient Sumerian texts that are coming forward, it's challenging a lot of the current narrative, and it's receiving a ton of pushback from notable religious societies who are trying to deface this and say that it can't possibly be true. Well, when it comes to the fact that when the human race is left with abrupt in-your-face type of content, you can do one of two things. You can try to embrace it and discover and lean more into it, or you can put, in, you can put your head in the sand because you're fearful of what you've been taught, what you've been indoctrinated with, and choose to ignore it, which is what a lot of society does. And as much as I love Christopher Nolan, as much as I believe that his work is incredible, I know that this was based off of a book. I think it was called uh, America's Prometheus, is what I believe that the book is actually titled, written in 2005. I need to get that book and read it to see if there was anything that perhaps Nolan chose to leave out of the Oppenheimer film. There's a couple other of, of really interesting points, too, about this mystical battle that took place in the Mahabharata, the Book of Drona. I find this rather fascinating as well because it has to do with pyramid technology, which has a ton of questions around it. What were the pyramids? What were they used for? Were they power centers? Were they energy centers for some type of spacecraft? Well, in the Mahabharata, in the Book of Drona, it talks about the mana technology. These were flying spacecraft. Were they primitive or were they far more advanced? Did technology exist that we don't have today or we've chosen to suppress for some reason? But these vimanas, there's pictures of them and ancient discoveries are being found of these vimanas. I'll just read you some of the details here. They are known as flying machines of varying degrees having been measured out or traversing is what it's supposed to mean. So Vimana translates to having been measured out or traversing. And these were machines piloted by the gods is what this book states. Again, think about this for a second. If you were an ancient civilization of any type and there was, there, there, there was some higher powered entity that had technology so far advanced that you knew nothing of or where it possibly would have come from, Would you not look to that entity as if it were a god? I think that's where a lot of the philosophy and perspective comes from with the gods. Anything or anyone that was notated as a god might have just been an entity that had a higher level of technology that the people of the time couldn't understand. It goes on to state, uh, much like from the biblical texts, where Ezekiel describes seeing visions of chariots of fire from the sky. Well, what would a chariot of fire from the sky be describing? A chariot in biblical times was their known vehicle of transportation. So a chariot of fire, well, that might be a UFO or a UAP or some higher level entity that has a capability that man of the time did not have. So again, all of this stuff has to be left for us to choose to decide for ourselves. I simply am finding such fascination in diving into this and have been for years. So I even wrote about this in my own book, 
which is titled Ungraduated, Finding Your Why and Dropping Out of Outdated Belief Systems, because so much of what I think we've been taught is just a sliver of what the truth actually is. And it is through physical media, books, movies, and music that I like to advance my level of study so that I can further my own knowledge, make my own decisions, and not necessarily just believe whatever I've been fed throughout time. Hence, what ungraduated means. It means to remove yourself from all the things that we believe to be true and analyze them for ourselves. So you be the judge on all of this. I love the Oppenheimer film. I think it's fantastic, but I have long awaited this film to come out and didn't see it in the theaters and finally having it, of course, on physical media. I was hoping to get a little bit more from the film around Oppenheimer's study into the Sanskrit language and texts of the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita, and there's only a slight reference in the film. But nonetheless, fantastic film. Would love to know your thoughts on this in the comments below, or if you're listening to the podcast that I have online, of course, you can reach out to me via email, which is there in the notes section as well. Just want to continue to grow as a community, however possible, to expand level of thought. And again, not just discuss the collectability, the wonderful world of collectability through that of movies, books, and music. Back to the film itself, though, before I wrap things up here, I did thoroughly enjoy it. I give it a four out of five. It didn't get a five out of five because I wanted to see more of the historical context in and around the Bhagavad Gita as well as the Mahabharata. It's only slightly touched on, so it's a very perspective-building film. I was more enlightened by how they treated Oppenheimer. I did not know he was raked over the coals like he was historically. So seeing how they treated him after the work that he did, yes, I know all the controversial ties to the Communist Party and whatnot that they tried to pin him with, but I, I was not aware that he was so heavily involved in a fight to basically clear his name and how they tried to more or less railroad him. Typical U.S. politics or politics in general, I guess, but that was super enlightening for me. But the film itself, I think overall, was very entertaining, fantastically done, could not recommend it enough. Wish there was more historical context from the Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata, but if you want a great historical film that talks about Oppenheimer, the Trinity Bomb, and how Oppenheimer was treated, if you have not yet seen Oppenheimer, definitely go check it out. And more importantly, try to find your copy because I hear they're selling out everywhere. Even the, the, just the standard release, of course, the Best Buy still book exclusives are long gone. The Icon edition, if you can get one, I get it. Uh, or if not, at least grab a normal standard edition because it is a great 4K, amazing audio, amazing video. You're just not going to get that replicated in streaming or on a digital platform. So get the film and watch it if you haven't for sure. So all of this said, how do you feel about it? Let me know in the comments below. I would love to engage in conversations with you and know this. Hey, I am a truth seeker. I love physical media. It helps me dive into perspective from others, be it directors, writers, musicians, but above all else, I just love to learn and I have to ask the big questions. Are you a big question type of person? I myself am somebody who has to dig in and find out the whys behind things. I am not a preachy person. I would never push my views on others, but I find it fascinating how some people will choose to put the blinders up because things don't make sense and how others dive headfirst into it. What kind of a person are you? Do you care? Do you not care? Does this stuff matter to you? Is it only about life here right now for you? Uh, and that's fine if it is. For me, it's got to be always trying to uncover more truths because I just can't help but think we are only getting a sliver, a snippet of what really is, is, is known and is out there. There is so much time that's been reported on this planet. We only live a very small sliver of it in terms of the greater perspective of time on earth, the humankind, human beings ourselves. We only live for on average 75 years in today's modern world so it's it's lost a lot of this information is lost over time and all we have is what's left and recorded and just because one level of society deems one thought perspective to be correct 
and the most accurate doesn't mean that it necessarily is. Hence why I think it's so important to continue to learn, develop, grow, do your own research, do your own study. Don't even just take it from me. Take this and research it yourself. Of course, you have to dig around on the internet. You gotta always watch your sources and find where you're, make sure you're getting good information, where you're getting it from. But know this, there's a lot more than meets the eye. <laughs> That's the famous Transformers saying goes. So if you've been here this far, thank you. If you haven't yet subscribed, do, because we talk about the collectability of movies, books, and music, but we get into the thought and philosophy and perspective around that type of stuff here too. So if you're on the podcast, of course, it's a follow or a subscribe. It's free, of course, to do that here on YouTube, of course. Also free to subscribe, like, comment. That does help the channel grow and is, of course, very appreciated. So until next time, do continue to find your own way through your own why. All the while remembering life is not in our hands, my friends. It all begins up here with the way we think and perceive reality, what we believe, which thus, of course, creates our actions, which, of course, dictates our lives and how they unfold. So take care for now. Talk to all of you again soon.